Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is The Wake-Up Call for Simon the Sorcerer. And I will be preaching from Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 9, going through verse 25. I have two points to my message today, and here they are. Simon saw the supernatural from another perspective. And second, Simon could not buy the Holy Spirit. I want to warn you in advance that I am taking an uncommon perspective of this passage of Scripture. If, the, if the, the preaching police are watching this message, they'll probably arrest me sometime this week. But I've tended to be one that did my own thinking. I'll consult commentaries from time to time to see what other Bible writers think. But ultimately, I'm accountable to the Lord for the message that I share with you. <clears throat> the, common, the common theme among many Christian writers about Simon is that he was not a true believer. But we will, we will see differently here in the scripture. I'm taking a different and uncommon perspective today that Simon was a believer. If you disagree with me on this, that's okay. We can, we can still have lunch together someday. But uh, whether, whether I'm right or wrong on that is really not the point. Uh, the point this morning is that the, the Holy Spirit was brought to the people in Samaria. First, I want you to see that Simon saw the supernatural from another perspective. Look with me in Acts chapter 8 verse 9. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, there's, there it is, but, the transitional word, but when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So what the scripture is telling us here is that all these people were focused on Simon, but when the word but comes up, it's transitional. It moves in another direction, but the people now focused on Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see verse 13. This is an important verse. I want you to underline this verse in your Bible. The scripture says, Simon himself believed and was baptized. There it is, right there in black and white. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Throughout the scripture, it speaks of several people who practiced Sor sorcery, divination, witchcraft, fortune telling. Uh, we have in Exodus, Pharaoh's prophets. Later, there's the witch of Endor that King Saul summoned, and then there are others throughout Scripture. These people are not regarded as people of God, and they're always regarded as, as people who had great powers. And here we have a New Testament manifestation of this in this man named Simon. I read about uh, this type of paranormal vocation as it was in the days of the Bible, but really we don't know much about the sorcery he performed. But sorcery itself is the invoking of evil spirits for evil purposes and that's really a discussion we could say well, evil spirits for evil purposes what it sounds like a like casting a spell or a, a curse on someone and hiring a sorcerer to do it 
The scripture says that he, he amazed people with it. He boasted about himself. He had a large following. And people confused his sorcery with the power of God. Why? Because that's all they knew up until this time. Clearly, Simon was a professional in his trade. He probably had clever business cards. Simon the sorcerer. Well, Philip the evangelist came upon the scene and he started preaching salvation. And many believed and were baptized, the scripture tells us, including Simon according to verse 13. This verse 13 is very important because I'm going to be referring to it several times in the scripture. Some people, some writers believe that sorcery is learned. In other words, this means that Simon had a teacher in the past. And now that he had become a believer in Jesus, according to verse 13, he now had a new teacher, or so he thought, and that was Philip. He followed Philip around. Simon saw for the first time a different type of supernatural happening. Sorcery is always talked about in a negative sense in the Bible. Intrinsically, it is, it is not good. But what was it that, uh, that he was fascinated with, with Philip? I think it was the nature of what Philip was doing. Philip's supernatural works were completely different. And I shouldn't have to say it, but if I don't, some super spiritual person is going to try to correct me. It wasn't Philip's works. It was the work of the Holy Spirit through Philip, right? Okay, I got that. I know that. You don't have to tell me that. But I'll just say Philip's miracles, Philip's works, Philip's healing. Philip's supernatural works were completely different. His works had nothing to do with conjuring up evil spirits or casting spells or anything like that. And as we learned from earlier in this chapter, Philip actually cast out evil spirits. And he healed lame people. And as we learned from verse 8, the result of Philip's efforts was joy. See, the result of Simon's efforts was amazement. The result of Philip's efforts was joy. There's a difference. Simon was fascinated with what he saw Philip doing and he just followed him everywhere he went. No doubt, Simon observed this joy as well. The nature of sorcery itself in the scripture was that of conjuring up, up evil spirits but not taking control of them like Philip did. And, and nothing about sorcery brought healing to people or brought joy to people. So this, this was all new stuff for the people in Samaria. This was all new stuff for this man named Simon. So here you have it. People who knew nothing about the supernatural other than sorcery and evil spirits. And Simon was a proprietor of such. A professional. And now they saw the supernatural from a completely different perspective. They had never even thought about people being healed before. They had never even thought about evil spirits being cast out of people before. No wonder there was so much joy. Because joy is what fuels hope. And when people saw uh, others healed, when they saw them in their right mind because an evil spirit had been cast out, they saw hope. Hey, maybe there's more to this life than the day-to-day -day drudgery. Maybe there's more to this life than when you want something done, hiring Simon the sorcerer to do it for you. When the people came to Jesus, their perspectives changed. When people came to Jesus, everything changed. Earlier in chapter 8, we read that the, that the Christians were scattered due to persecution but that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Do you remember reading that? It's earlier here in chapter 8. Now the good news of what had happened in Samaria had made it back to the apostles, and the apostles sent two to help. In other words, reinforcements came to help out the good movement of God. Look in verse 14. 
When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now there's a bit of an aside here that's necessary. It has nothing to do with the story of Simon. But I want to point this out to you. This is very important. Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 10 are transitional chapters. It's a transitional time when the gospel, when, when, when being able to get to God, went from the Jews to the Samaritans to the Gentiles. So the purpose for the apostles bringing the Holy Spirit to Samaria, I believe, was to bring unity. In other words, there didn't need to be two separate churches, two separate movements. So these, these apostles, Peter and John, who were Jews, brought the, the Holy Spirit uh, to the people in Samaria. And then after Acts 10, everything changes. But we'll talk more about that later. Secondly, I want you to see that Simon could not buy the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a term that I'm, we're not really familiar with. It's called uh, simony, if I pronounced it right. It's Simon with a, with a Y on the end. And do you know what that is? That is a term used when people try to buy positions in a church. And that term comes from Simon. In the book of Acts, we find a conflict between money and what, what, what we might call big business. Ananias and Sapphira died because they lied about their gift in Acts chapter 5. Paul shut down a fortune teller in Acts chapter 16 and he went to jail for it. And in Acts chapter 19, Paul got into it with the silversmiths and caused a riot. Those are exciting scriptures and we'll get to those in a few weeks. The main focus of Acts is the spreading of the gospel even when it conflicted with particular trades and people who earned a living doing something contrary to the gospel or contrary to the news of the gospel. Now we have Simon who is in the business of sorcery. Look in verse 18. In verse 18 the scripture says, When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, Simon shouldn't have done that. He tried to buy the Holy Spirit. He tried to buy the ability to pass on the Holy Spirit. But here's, here's, where, here's where I'm taking a non-traditional approach to this man, Simon. I'm, I'm banking the story here on, on verse 13 that uh, Simon was indeed a believer and had been baptized. It doesn't say that he insincerely believed. Well, I want you to hear this, okay? We need to keep in mind here that Simon was very new to the gospel. In fact, he was a baby Christian. Perhaps only a few weeks old in the faith. He was not a man who grew up around churches because there weren't any. He was not a man who grew up around Christians and, and the scriptures because, because they weren't there. The whole movement was brand new. And Simon, at, at the oldest of a Christian, was only a few weeks old. In his, in his past experience, money was connected with sorcery and no doubt, that's how he made a living. But he, he made a mistake. You see, his past was still part of who he was. Even though he had become a believer and had been baptized. What was Peter's response to Simon? 
making this request, you know, to buy the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter gave an answer that only Peter would give. Verse 20, Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Folks, there's a very important principle here that everyone needs to see. It's clear to me now, but it was not clear to me before I read this passage for the hundredth time, I guess, in my life. It is important for us to be patient with new believers. They do not know. They do not understand. Now, as you know, Peter was impulsive at times. And he said things, and he did things out of emotion. Once he did not like uh, something that was said to Jesus, and so he, he just drew out his sword and just cut off a man's ear. <laughs> That's pretty impulsive, isn't it? You know, we talk about censorship today, but wow, Peter just didn't like it. I'll shut him up, pow. And then Jesus, as you know, healed the man's ear. And in Matthew chapter 16, Peter rebuked Jesus. And then Jesus rebuked Peter right back. And then later in the scripture, Peter denied Jesus three times. And Jesus, in his patience and love for Peter, allowed Peter three opportunities to make up for denying him three times. And here in, in Acts chapter 8, we have classic Peter. But I don't want to be too judgmental on Peter here. So Let's, let's assume, however, that Peter was full of the Holy Spirit when he rebuked the new believer. And if that is indeed the case, which I believe it is, then Peter said exactly what Simon needed to hear because Simon was so entrenched in his old way of thinking. See, Simon didn't need somebody to pat him on the back and say, oh, you, you don't understand. Simon needed somebody like Peter to be tough. Why did he need that? Because Simon only knew one model of the supernatural. He wanted to pay to be able to spread the power of the Holy Spirit as he understood it, which means he probably didn't understand the Holy Spirit. He was just impressed with what he saw. Somewhere in our Christian culture, we have this false idea that when a person comes to Christ, that person completely lets go of their past including all of their presuppositions. Simon was a sorcerer who had been caught up in the work of Satan for years. Again, let me run you to verse, back to verse 13. He believed and was baptized. So is verse 13 wrong? Should it not be there? Is it a mistake? No, it is not. Simon was just a new believer, a baby Christian, and he had a lot to learn, which means he had a lot to surrender. If a person comes to Jesus Christ as a child, as a little child, like many of you did, and, and you grow up learning the Bible, then you, you've got little or maybe no baggage to let go of. Now, as you get older and temptations come into your life, you realize that you've got to surrender that to the Lordship of Jesus. But when a person comes to Christ as an adult, they, they have more baggage to let go of. Do you understand what I'm saying here? They may struggle with letting go at some times. Do you know what that struggle is? The reality of struggling and surrendering. Struggling and surrendering. Do you know what that is? Growth. It's growth. Simon could have taken the rebuke from Peter as an insult. He could have said, Hey, you can take it all. I don't want it. I'm going back to my former lifestyle. 
but he did not. Look what Simon did in verse 25. Excuse me, in verse 24. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. So you see that Simon's attitude was that of humility. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. What I believe we have here in, in verse 24 is Simon's repentance in the best way he knew how to do it. As I said earlier, my take on this diverts from what many scholars and preachers believe. They will interpret this as Simon being more concerned about judgment than about being right with God. I don't really see it that way because, again, verse 13 tells us that he believed and was baptized. It does not say that Simon believed in Peter's miracles. It said he believed and was baptized, and it's, that's the same language used when other people believed and were baptized. So here we have Simon, who believed in Jesus, had been baptized, but made a mistake. Why? Because he did not know any better. New believers need mentors who will be patient, who will help them, who will correct them when they are wrong. And whatever happened to Simon, I don't know, but with the gospel spreading like it did in Samaria, no doubt Simon had many opportunities to have mentors and to grow as a believer. The title of the message is The Wake-Up Call for Simon the Sorcerer. Do you remember Jesus and the rich young ruler? Jesus knew that money was at the heart of that rich young ruler, and he told him, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor. And the man walked away sad. You know, Jesus knows what, what all of our strongholds are. And he knew that, that the stronghold of Simon was, was, was money, just like the rich young ruler. And the Lord provided a rebuke through Peter. The wake-up call for Simon the sorcerer was this. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is serious. It's not a joke. It's not a part-time hobby. Do you have part-time hobbies? Some you get interested in, do a little bit, leave it for days, weeks, months, never get back to it. Part-time hobbies. Some people treat their salvation, their relationship with Jesus as a part-time hobby. The wake-up call to Simon the sorcerer was that. Coming to Jesus is serious business. It's not anything to joke about. It's not anything to offer money for, for powers or for the Holy Spirit. It's not wise. It's wrong. The wake-up call for Simon the sorcerer was that Jesus was to be Lord of all, not Lord of some of his life. Simon had a whole lot to learn. A young believer. I know a woman who's older now that told me when she was saved as a, as a woman in her 20s, there were people who tried to help her, but they spoke in such biblical terms and church terms, and they used so much scripture when they talked with her that it made her feel inferior. She felt like she would never attain to that, that level of spirituality that they had. I am sure those women meant well. But people, we've got to learn when someone comes to faith in Jesus, if, you, if, you, if you've known the Lord 80 years and your great-grandchild comes to the Lord at age 15, you've got to understand you've got a lot of years of growth and development on that great-grandchild. 
And you're going to have to be patient and loving and kind and explain things. If you know someone, if you have a friend that has come to faith in Christ at an older age, or maybe even if you have, you know what I'm talking about, about letting go of the baggage. You know, we've got what's just called neuropathways in the brain. You know, we get caught in these loops, don't we? We get caught in these loops of thinking and behaving. And we need people that are patient around us to, to help us know that's, no, that's not what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. We need people who can patiently say to, to new believers, especially those who come to faith in Christ as adults, no, that, that's not true. This is what's true. Can we be like that? Sure, I believe that we can. The wake-up call for Simon the sorcerer. wonder what happened to Simon. I don't know. But Peter's rebuke was pretty strong. And I feel like Simon's response was, was pretty humble. Pray that none of this happens to me. We're going to have our invitation time. I want to ask you, do you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know him? Do you, have you repented of your sins? Have you given all that you know to be of yourself to all that you know to be of him? If you have done that, are there new areas in your life that you need to surrender to him? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, during our invitation time, I pray that your spirit would move among us, convict the person who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior to repent and believe today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Terry's going to lead us in our invitation hymn. If you want to come forward to be saved, to know this Savior, We'll be glad to pray with you if you've already done that and you want to let others know uh, this is the time and place to do it. If you have been saved and you want to be baptized, which is a, an outward expression of that inward decision that you've made, we want to talk with you about that. Or if you want to come forward for a prayer for healing or anything else. Just to